we've been working on the railroad, next on Columbus Neighborhoods. Support for Columbus Neighborhoods is provided by... At American Electric Power, we've been proud sponsors of WOSU Public Media for many years and strong supporters of our headquarters city here in Columbus, both downtown and in neighborhoods like yours. State Auto Insurance Companies, transforming to become a digital provider of auto, home, and business insurance. And for nearly 100 years, committed to the people and neighborhoods of Central Ohio. State Auto. The Columbus Foundation, smart philanthropy for a smart city. ColumbusFoundation.org. Bailey Cavalieri, your relationship with your law firm doesn't need to be complicated, it just needs to be right. CODA, keeps our community moving forward. Falgren Moortime Marketing and Communications, think wider. Ohio Health focuses on you and your family with a mission to improve the health of our communities. Women in Philanthropy at Ohio State, changing lives by giving together. And by contributions from these and other Columbus area families who support WOSU. Thank you. Columbus's railroads are part of a vast network connecting countless destinations. In the late 1800s, thousands of carloads of coal and tile came to Columbus from Haydenville, which today is called the last company town in Ohio. Here's the story of Peter Hayden and the empire he built with coal and clay. Peter Hayden was this rather remarkable individual uh, from New York. He started out when he was about 19 years old and signed a contract with the Auburn Penitentiary for inmate labor. And what he did is he created a saddlery within the walls of the prison using the inmates to create the hardware for the saddles. And he also made hand tools. He did that for about nine years or so, and for some reason he decided to come to Columbus. He struck a deal with the Ohio Penitentiary to use inmate labor to create another saddlery and another company making hand tools. At some point, he decided he needed coal, and he was drawn to this area. We had the iron ore, we had coal, there was salt down here, uh, sandstone, all this that they needed elsewhere. Hayden was fortunate in that he arrived just as the canal system was unfolding across Ohio. The feeder canal to Columbus was completed in 1831 and started extending this way, reaching down to, you know, through Nelsonville to Athens. Yeah. I'm amazed at how square they are. This canal ran from about 1836. There was about 30 years. It was about all they got out of the canals. Then it was replaced by the trains. Haydenville is one of the little cities of Black Diamonds, and they were called that because they were developed around coal mining. Coal was discovered in the Hocking Valley in as early as 1755. The interesting thing about when he came here and found the coal was he also found really rich deposits of clay. It was in 1883 that Peter Hayden founded the Haydenville Mining and Manufacturing Company to take advantage of the clay that was here. And they used the clay for bricks, for uh, silo tile, for conduit, anything that you could make out of clay, they made here. They even made umbrella stands. Work in a tile factory would be very hard, very hot labor. Um, it would be sweaty. You would be on a team with a lot of people doing very, very manual work. The plant had up to 360 people at one time working for them. Some worked in coal mines, some worked in the clay mines, some worked on the railroad and in the factory, in the kilns and there'd be somebody standing there shoveling coal in that thing all day. The thing about having this uh, manufacturing operation here is that you needed housing for your people. And he had this idea of creating a model community and he ended up building all of these houses out of products that came out of his plant. Uh, they're built out of brick, tile, sewer pipes. 
being in a company town means everything is owned by the company. The community, the homes, all your needs are met by the company. So in a company town, since the company owns the land and owns the houses, for the most part they're going to be very similar. Housing would be assigned most likely by the company, so different families of different sizes might be able to um, sort of argue their way into something more unique, something a little bit bigger if they needed it. Um, also, supervisors might be entitled to a larger house, more space, more of a yard. Yeah, I particularly like these because they have more decorative features than the straight row houses do. You see, they've got arched windows and arched doors, whereas the row houses don't. But the sewer pipe, or say sewer gothic, it was called, uh, makes it really stand out. I assume that these were for uh, some of the higher people in the company. So there's just a group of them along here. There used to be five of them. Behind me is a really unique church. It's the Haydenville Church built out of the Haydenville tile. So that's going to be all local clay that you see there making the really beautiful designs. I found this fascinating that the town basically was salesman samples, that they would bring customers to Haydenville to see how their tile and brick and everything they manufacture, all their ceramics could be used. This house behind us, it's built of silo tile. Yes. So if you want to see what a silo tile building would look like, this is an example of it. There were 17 or so built in about 1917. We had a couple over by the Hawking River, and we had this one, and then the rest were clear over at the mines. So one of the problems with a company town is when the company leaves, when the company folds, when there's massive layoffs, there's no longer a town to be supported. There's no more company store. Uh, the people who live there either don't have their homes anymore because they're not working for the company anymore, or if the land has been sold off to individuals, there's no real reason to stick around. Um, and unfortunately, that's part of what happened in this area. This was partially due to the rise of mechanization. Haydenville was considered the last of the company towns. The Natco Company sold off the houses in 1964. That time there were 112 houses, eight of which were doubles. From an industrial standpoint, Peter Hayden definitely was one of the founders of Columbus. He had his fingers in everything, and he had uh, businesses in Chicago, Detroit, San Francisco, New Jersey. He was in banking. He was involved with streetcars. He made cannonballs during the Civil War. His bank, the Hayden Clinton Bank, is the oldest building on Capitol Square in downtown Columbus. And yet, you know, we don't really recognize his name anymore. Now, he was also well loved here. He was very good to his people. And for a good hard day's work, he gave them a good living. The inscription on this beautiful window, which was dedicated to Peter Hayden, reads, So he fed them according to the integrity of his heart and guided them by the skillfulness of his hands. I think that that really is kind of a testament to the legacy of Peter Hayden in this community. So I think the legacy of Peter Hayden is alive and well in the people who are still in these towns. As we were researching the book, we met a lot of people who are really devoted to this area. Maybe their grandfathers or great-grandfathers worked here, their families from here. They love it here. Black. National Register Black. Towns like this really need something new to come in. Tourism, I think, could be wonderful in this area. It's a gorgeous area. So what Haydenville really needs is another woman or man like Peter Hayden, someone who sees the potential value, sees what could happen here, and then really makes it happen. Railroads come and go. Some have been busy for decades, and others were used for a while and then fell into neglect. The same is true of many of the depots that used to serve the Columbus area. Many have disappeared, but as we see in this edition of Driving with Darby, some wonderful railroad stations have survived. We're going to Canal Winchester today. The town settled in 1828, and we are pulling up to the former Hocking Valley Railway Station. It's now the Canal Winchester Historical Society's property. The Canal Winchester Historical Society has done a good job preserving local history. We're going to go find out more about the story. 
Oh yeah, this is great. <laughs> this is my kind of place. A historic brick school, a historic wood grain elevator, historic cabooses, my kind of place. Jeff, good how to are see you? you. Yeah, good to see you. How are you? Thanks so much for having me over today. What do you think of the Columbia? This is just great. I've, I've known for a long time that the Canal Winchester Area Historical Society has been working on this, but things are looking really good. You've done a really great job here. Thank you, thank you. And That's I guess the, the, the gem of the collection, I guess, is the old Hocking Valley Depot. The depot. Let's go take a look at it. Okay. Oh, this is a great old building. Now, this was built by the Hocking Valley. Yeah, in fact, the first train that came through here was on January 13th, 1869. Okay. And the, the original depot was built that same year. Mm -hmm. October of 1894 is when it burnt down. Okay. A uh, spark from one of the engines. That'll yeah. do it. Uh, less than two months later, it was reopened. December 3rd, hmm. it was completely rebuilt in this, and this is the original one since This is the building. Okay, okay. Well, and you can see it's from a later period. It's, it's got those late Victorian, Queen Anne kind of stylistic features, the different siding, the diagonal, the vertical siding, the brackets supporting the roof. Of course, it's got a bay window. That's where the agent, the operator oh. would sit. You know, he could see the trains coming Watch in. them coming and going, because the agent sold tickets, but he also was an operator who controlled train he movements. Was, he was the station master. Yes, yes, and, right. And uh, he controlled the freight, the baggage, and everything. Right, because this was what's called a combination station. Three rooms. There was a passenger area, his office, mm -hmm. and then the baggage or freight mm -hmm. area. Okay, and they would handle mail as well. Right. And also express. I mean, the railway express was... was right. Was it was the there. FedEx of the day. Right. Adams Express was one yep. of them. Yeah, right. And they all combined later on. And the colors, these are the Hocking Valley colors, aren't they? Right. The, the two tones colors. of green. There's three. There's three olive mm -hmm. greens and a Chinese red. Okay. Boy, it is beautiful. And did you find these colors underneath when you uh, did uh, research? When they did the research on it, uh, yes. Okay. We did find it, and okay. uh, and as you can see, the ornate Victorian eaves. Yes, right, with the brackets. Right. And here you can see where the control mechanism was for the odor So that was all manual. Right. I mean, he had to pull a lever. There's two levers in there that... Mm -hmm. uh, to raise and lower the arms. Right. And there would have been a lantern of some sort to light the, light the, light the light lenses the at night. Lenses okay. Right. Boy, it, it really is very complete. Yeah, I'm, I'm um, a fairly fervent rail fan, so this is all a great interest to me. Well, this this is uh, one of our pride and joys. Oh, yeah. Well, let's, shall we take a look inside and yeah, see some of those details? All right, let's do it. Come on in, Jeff. Ah, the waiting room. Yes, yes. And it really didn't connect to any other part of the building except the... Uh, Agent, operator. The agent operator. Okay. If you notice, it's unique because it's uh, an octagon shape. It is, and it wasn't, was that unique to the, uh, the Hocking Valley? It wasn't typical. It was most. the only one. Yeah. That's why it was referred to as the queen of the line. Ah, And if okay. you notice, the stained glass, that's the original stained glass from 1890. Never gotten broken, isn't that Never amazing? Gotten. So this is sort of typical Victorian treatment too. You've got the plaster upper walls, you've got the wainscoting on the, on the lower walls the arched windows, it really is a product of its time, that late 19th century. When, it is. It's, and the railroads purposely went to a lot of trouble because this was sort of the point of contact between the railroad company and the, yeah, and the it, public. It, it's a gem. I yeah, mean, it's, yeah it's, it really it's, is. It's, uh, it's unique. So then the railroad came through, what, 1869, you said? That was mm -hmm. the Hocking Valley. And of course, that tapped the coal fields of Southeast oh, Ohio. That's yeah. what opened them up. This used to be a double line out here. Double and track, it, okay. And the uh, trains used to run through here about every 15 minutes. So it was kind of a conveyor belt for coal. Right. In fact, uh, right across the um, tracks here used to be a coal. Uh, mm -hmm. It was a retail yard because yeah. people would use it for heating, not just for industry or for locomotives, that sort of thing. Yeah. Well, there are other parts of the uh, building to see. Yeah, uh, this would be the uh, station master's office, and this is where they would sell tickets. Uh, once again, this is the original. And, so uh, it's a combination door and window. That's pretty cool. And to get in, you flip this up and that's, watch your head. That's, that's pretty good. Oh, yeah. I, yeah. I have not seen that in other stations. This is, this is unusual. Yeah, this, this would be the um, station master's... Um, mm -hmm. So he did all his business here. All his business. And Train he control, it. ticket selling, keeping yeah. the record. And you have some great models here. This is yeah, I belong to uh, Columbus Area Enscalers. Mm -hmm. It's a train group here in town, mm -hmm. and we built the layout in the uh, baggage room. Oh, here. we better have a look at that. Yeah. That's, a, that's, that's one of my interests. <laughs> Oh, 
Oh wow, look at this. <laughs> this is several hundred square feet of really good modeling. <laughs> well, if you look at the middle uh, area there, that depicts canal winch. That looks familiar. I think I've seen this before. If you look at there, there's the O.P. Cheney and yeah, Sons yeah, elevator. There's the, there's the spur where the cabooses are. Yeah, there's the uh, uh -huh. depot. And it has the double track. Mm -hmm. Great. Is, and there's the canal. There's the canal, right? And, that's, and there's the uh, towpath, which we have. Oh, the, the interurban, uh, of course. The interurban. If oh, you yeah. look, there's oh, look a third rail on that. Oh, sure enough, the Saturday wow. Valley ran from a third rail, like the subways do mm -hmm. in New York and Chicago. And there's the uh, uh, depot that was up there. People are amazed about this. The day we put the water tower here on the layout is mm -hmm. the day they cut this down. <laughs> we were, I was standing here and I heard this big crash. And they, they knocked it, it over. Down. That's too but, bad. Uh, and everything here is from made from scratch. If you saw what was going, this thing here is prescription bottles, threads, <laughs> straws. You know, it's <laughs> That's what the model builders do. They use what they've got and they use some imagination and they can really turn out wonderful stuff. That's a great water tower. Well, thanks so much. It's been great getting to know yeah. more about the place. And Thank I've you. always loved this depot. And you people have done just a wonderful job with it. Mm -hmm. And uh, best luck for the future. Thank you. Thanks Thank you so very much. much. Columbus's last passenger train departed Union Station in 1977. But it's not entirely accurate to say we no longer have a railroad. The Camp Chase Railroad isn't locally owned, and it doesn't haul passengers, but it serves local customers near its rail yard by the Hollywood Casino. Here's the story of the little Columbus Railroad that could. Originally, this line was built between 1872 and 1873 by what was then a small company called the Columbus and Springfield Railroad. That was in time absorbed into a large railroad company called the New York Central Railroad. They operated it throughout World War II and so forth. It ended up in what's called Conrail. Conrail owned it until 1994 when it became the Camp Chase Railroad, an independent uh, operation. Now we've changed ownership, we're the Camp Chase Railway. The Camp Chase Railway is owned by a corporation that either owns or operates four different short line railroads such as this. Right here in Columbus we have 15 miles of track that we own and operate. Ultimately we do tie into a nationwide rail system that includes over 100,000 miles, well over 100,000 miles of rail and coast to coast and connects with other countries and so forth. This is a freight railroad so we handle just bulk commodities. Our major customers here are the flour mill that's uh, right off of Sullivan Avenue. They receive wheat from out west. We also serve a major newspaper printing facility, so much of the paper that you find on the newsstands probably came in on our train. And what's called a transload facility, which is where customers who don't have rail to their site can bring in any kind of bulk material on the train and offload or transload it onto a truck for that last mile delivery. A car here that's loaded on our railroad, maybe at the dock of a warehouse or something along those lines. Once loading's complete, the customer contacts us and contacts our larger railroad partners, Norfolk Southern and CSX, and submits billing on the car to its final destination. We bring it out to the rail yard and the larger railroads ship it cross country. We run first for a few miles on our own track, then we ask for permission from Norfolk Southern's dispatchers to run on their main line to Buckeye Yard and Hilliard. And that is the location where we interchange or exchange cars with Norfolk Southern. Typically, we'll run out with cars to hand off to Norfolk Southern and CSX. We'll set those cars in one track of the yard and we'll hop over to a different track. And there's some cars for us to bring back for our own customers online. The tanker cars that you may see west of Columbus are kind of in temporary staging, so maybe the plant that they're used to delivering materials for is down for maintenance or some kind of seasonal um, demand or lack thereof causes them to, to need a spot to stay temporarily and we'll do that. Storage helps us out on sections of the track where we don't have active customers. We can store these cars and make enough money to continue to maintain that infrastructure for future business developments. 
On a short line railroad such as this, we try to have a lean staff, and that means that each one of us does a little bit of everything. So one day I may be in the office doing paperwork, pushing numbers and so forth. The next day I could be out with these guys uh, running train or maybe pounding spikes on the track doing some maintenance work. A lot of these tracks that we operate on would not be profitable if ran by the larger railroads. It's largely a product of deregulation around 1980 or so. The Staggers Act, as, as they call it from Congress, um, allowed the larger railroads to hand off parts of their system that were weighing down their operation and making it hard to maintain, such as these branch lines that don't really connect on a, on a major route. And that's where these short line railroads or regional railroads, so to speak, came into play. The customers that we serve rely on rail shipment to stay competitive and keep their employees at work. So if we weren't here, then there would be a lot of people that looking for other jobs uh, just, just from the lack of logistical advantage. Railroads owe a lot to a Columbus inventor who became known as the Black Edison. He invented devices that improved electric railway cars. Another invention helped engineers know how close they were to the other trains. Here's more on the amazing Granville T. Woods. Granville T. Woods was one of the most prolific inventors of the 19th century and into the early 20th century. He's born in Columbus in 1856 to free black parents. He was a very adept and very smart guy, and in 1872, he got a job working for a local railroad. He managed to work in an understanding of both mechanical as well as the rudiments of what will later become electrical engineering. By the early 1880s, He's left the railroads, and he's worked going off to become an independent inventor. Woods is going to have a variety of patents for a number of different kinds of things. His most famous single invention is the multiplex telegraph. The problem that railroads had in those days was that they didn't have a way to easily communicate one with another. So if you were driving a train along at 50 mile an hour, you had no way of knowing if there was a stopped train right around that bend. What this meant was that there are a lot of train accidents. One of the things that Woods comes up with is a telegraph system that permits messages on a moving train to basically be transmitted wirelessly to an, a telegraph line running along the side of the train tracks. What this means is the trains can talk to each other. And so a lot of trains and lives are saved because of that particular invention. Woods by this time had moved to New York City with friends and relatives. He had set up the Woods Electric Company, and that company was quite successful all the way up until the time of Woods' death. Woods suffered a stroke in 1910. By the time he dies, he has more than 60 patents. He is still considered today by electrical engineering organizations, university engineering departments, to be one of the most creative and prolific inventors in America, regardless of race. Thanks for being with us. And remember, you can catch all our episodes on ColumbusNeighborhoods.org. Plus, see our stories on the WSU mobile app. And you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We'll see you back here next week on Columbus Neighborhoods. Well, I was born down in the heart of Ohio. Done my mama proud, so I sit on down the road. Headed down south where the peaches grow. My love is coming down the line. My love is coming down the line. My love is coming down the line. southern girl with her deep blue southern eyes we dance the night away 
hate the starlit southern skies, but heartache blew on the wind that night. My love is coming down the line. Support for Columbus Neighborhoods is provided by... At American Electric Power, we've been proud sponsors of WOSU Public Media for many years and strong supporters of our headquarters city here in Columbus, both downtown and in neighborhoods like yours. State Auto Insurance Companies, transforming to become a digital provider of auto, home, and business insurance. And for nearly 100 years, committed to the people and neighborhoods of Central Ohio. State Auto. The Columbus Foundation, smart philanthropy for a smart city. ColumbusFoundation.org. Bailey Cavalieri, your relationship with your law firm doesn't need to be complicated, it just needs to be right. CODA, keeps our community moving forward. Falgren Wartime Marketing and Communications, think wider. Ohio Health focuses on you and your family with a mission to improve the health of our communities. Women in Philanthropy at Ohio State, changing lives by giving together. And by contributions from these and other Columbus area families who support WOSU. Thank you.